Hello, my name is Joy Bardowell and welcome once again to Truth Unraveled. Today's study is a continuation of trying to identify the woman of Revelation 17 and I have entitled today's study The Bride Who Became a Harlot and this is part three within that series. So, but before I go into the study, let us have a word of prayer. Father God, today as we approach your word, give us a deep sense of your holiness as well as a deep sense of your unending love towards us. Help us to maintain a spirit of gratitude and loyalty to you. Keep before us the reality of your sacrifice, that we may seek always to please you by living unto you in righteousness. Help us to hold firmly to your truth and walk in them with all our hearts, as we give you thanks in your holy and precious name. Amen. Now as usual, I've always decided to place before you Revelation 17, 1 and Revelation 21, 9 because they are, they are the perfect parallels and there's a reason behind it. In Revelation 17, 1 it says, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Then Revelation 21, 9 says, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now these are not two separate persons. They are one. The scripture is very clear about that. What the scripture teaches actually is that the harlot was once the bride of God and then she went off and got herself entangled with many men and those are the, 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 the whole thing about the description of many men what God is speaking of is getting involved in worshiping other gods that's how God described it in in that vivid terms and and some of the the, 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 the records that are there are almost explicit so <laughs> Uh, that's true. So what I'm going to show you is that she became a harlot and God is going to restore her. So then by the time you get to Revelation 21, 9, he says, I'll show you the bride. For the sake of laying today's uh, foundation for today's study, again, we go through the recap. And Revelation 17, 2, which is what all of the study is based on, it says the kings of the world have had immoral relations with her. Now, you'll have to go back to part one and part two to get that full explanation of this verse and the other subsequent verses I'm going to read quickly. Now, the word immoral mainly speaks of person's lifestyle, their character, and it mainly down to base, it's about your behavioral pattern. Now, when we think of this, We'll have to take a deeper look into Revelation 17 too, because this affects just about everyone on the earth. But before I move on to the study, there's an observation I want to make. Look at the word immorality. What is missing from that word when you think of the word immortality? Just the, the letter T. In essence, this woman exchanged what the Lord had been providing for her, because when when she was in Egypt, and that's Israel, God provided the means through blood sacrifice as a looking forward to what would actually happen through his son Yeshua when he would come to earth and die on the cross for us. And she exchanged that for immorality. And that's what most of us do. We do not want this eternal life because immorality is the opposite of immortality. And the only thing that makes a difference is that T between that letter immorality and immortality. And that's a cross. So the whole of this study is really about sacrifice. As I've said over and over in every study, the entire Bible is about the sacrifice and the temple. So Revelation 17.3 spoke about he took me in the spirit to a desert and that's what John saw the spirit took him to the desert why that's because after she left Egypt God took her through the desert through the wilderness I had also put up Revelation 17 4 before you and I showed you that this uh, verse has three parts to it one the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet then two it tells us that she was adorned with gold, precious stones, and pearls. Now, 
that's a part of her clothing her bedding clothing as i told you and the last portion says and she had in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality that has to do with her harlotry that's after she was married now when you look at this what you're going to find i'm going to take you to the book of ezekiel today chapter 16 and and Isaiah chapter 1 and you're going to see all of these three parts will be thoroughly explained in the scripture finally in the previous study i brought it to revelation 17 5 where we looked at this word where it says and on her forehead was written a name of mystery babylon the great mother of harlots and of earth's abominations now i gave you a full explanation of this in part two so i'd advise you to go back there but for the sake of recapping i pointed out to you that this verse has the only parallel for it in the entire bible is found in jeremiah 3 verse 3 where we read these words Jeremiah 3 verse 3 says you have had a harlot's forehead you refuse to be ashamed now as I said it's the only verse in the entire Bible where you find those two words meet together harlot and forehead that's Revelation 17 5 and this verse Jeremiah 3 verse 3 so they are the perfect parallels God wanted it to be that way because he wanted us to make no mistake about this to explain that I took you to Exodus 12 verse 13 to show you something that in verse 12 we saw look at the bottom portion there it says that and God actually that's talking about God execute judgment upon all the gods of Egypt for I am Jehovah now that was what God was doing when he sent all those plagues in Egypt against the land of Egypt to get his people out of there from the bondage of slavery and remember the bondage of slavery in Egypt is a representation of bondage to sin that is why there's the blood that is why the sacrifice it's not about just taking out the people it's about uh, sin so now let us look at verse 13 says the, the blood on the doorpost will be proof that you obey me now the doorpost is a kind of representation of the doorpost of your mind somebody will say heart but usually it's really the parallel for heart the real word is your mind now if you're really obeying it's your mind has to do that work and so now let us look at the other portion and oh by the way and your mind has everything to do with your forehead because that's where the, where the forehead is that's your frontal lobe where you do all your thinking and reasoning and your will that's what it's all about this verse tells it all when God took uh, Israel out of Egypt and had the judgment on the gods that's how he could get them out of Egypt then when they left they were supposed to keep covenant with him covenant relationship a mad relationship as you're going to see but when they didn't they turned back to worship the gods of Egypt and the gods of Babylon and so on and that's what God calls harlotry now on their forehead and when you get to uh, Exodus 13 verse 9 you're going to read something there about the forehead and I'll explain it as I go along and you're going to see that it's all about obedience to God that's what he requires so another thing the slain of the Passover lamb and the blood that was shed has everything to do with temple tabernacle sacrifices and we're going to see also that connection as we study this because that's all this is all about this whole thing about this harlot now let us move on now, everything about the sacrifice that took place in Exodus really speaks about Yeshua. And here he says in verse 15 that they are to have a celebration that lasts seven days. And that celebration had to do with the fact that it is to remind them of this fatal night. Verse 14 tells us that because that fatal night was that he killed all the firstborn of Egypt and he spared them. Now, what happens is, is that yeast is a particle of corruption throughout the entire Bible. And in Yeshua there is no form of corruption and he, he, then now this celebration was supposed to be done yearly as a reminder of that particular night now we looked over and I took you over to uh, Exodus 13 to show you that this concept was brought over into Exodus 13 because it's a continued thought in Exodus 13 we had also looked at Exodus 13 verse 4 it says celebrate this day of your Exodus at the end of March each year when Jehovah brings you into the land of the Canaanites Hittites Amorites Hivites and the Jebusites the land he promised your fathers now we know and as I've shown you before in several texts in several teachings I should say that this is referring to uh, Genesis 10 with the whole line from 
Aham go going down through Nimrod and you can look back at all those teachings I showed you on uh, when I spoke about they are Babylonians not Israelites when I told you about the captivity and all that now I also told you that this land is the area of issue and that is what's causing all the conflict as we were going to as, as you've seen all that I presented so far in the book of Revelation even about the geographical area and why this woman is also um, on th sitting on the body of waters or on many waters just as you'd find Rome and Babylon as it were now what you find here is that this set of people that he was going to take them into the land as I said before God said do not make any covenant with these people you need to drive them out you're going I'm going to help you to drive them out get rid of their altars and everything so that you don't worship their gods now that list of people that I've just read in the Exodus 13 4 are a list of people that directly came on the Nimrod as I said and that's Babylon so let us have a look at that again for the sake of time I'll just read verse 6 8 10 and 15 the sons of Ham were Cush Mizraim put Canaan Verse 8, one of the descendants of Cush was Nimrod, who became the first of the kings. Verse 10, the heart of his empire included Babel, Ekre, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Verse 15, Canaan's oldest son was Sidon, and he was also the father of Heth. From Canaan descended these nations. Notice, Zeb Jebusites, Amorites, Gergesites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Avatites, Zamorites, Hamathites, and eventually descendants of Canaan spread from Sidon all the way to Giver in the Gaza Strip and to Sodom, Gomorrah, Abna, Zeboam, and Lachish. So what you're seeing here, even the descendants of Canaan were those who were called Sodom and Gomorrah. They were also the very ones that were under the whole Babel. Now Babel is really Babylon and Shinar is Babylon. When you get to, to Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 you read that Nebuchadnezzar took all the things of the temple and he placed it in the temp in the treasury of his God in Shinar so do you see what we're dealing with God's people were to live in that land in other words the Canaanite territory and the Hittites territory was actually Babylonian territory now take a look at the next clipping I'll read verse 27 28 30 32 uh, I will have the fear of me precede you so that I will throw into panic every nation you reach I will make all your enemies turn from you in flight then he said 28 and ahead of you I will send hornets to drive the Hivites Canaanites and Hittites out of your way drop down to 30 instead I will drive them out little by little before you until you have grown numerous enough to take possession of the land but notice what he says in verse 32 you must make no covenant with them nor have anything to do with their gods a close note at um, Exodus 34 11 to 15 it says I will drive out before you the Amorites Canaanites Hittites Perizzites Hivites and Jebusites take care therefore not to make a covenant with these inhabitants of the land that you are to enter else they will become a sneer among you tear down their altars smash their sacred pillars and cut down their sacred poles you shall not worship any other god for the lord is the jealous one a jealous god is he notice verse 30 uh, 15 lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods did you get that and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifices so notice you, sacrifice is going to be involved in, in getting involved with these people there's a covenant going to be made there's sacrifice going to be made and you're going to be worshipping their gods see so and it's all these same people the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites they are under the Babylonian rule as I just showed you now that is why when you get to the book of Revelation you're reading about this Jerusalem because by the time God's people got a temple 
they were doing the exact things that he told them not to do even before that and so that's harlotry he says that if you make covenant with these people if you haven't to do with their gods if you sacrifice it that's harlotry we just read it in verse 15 and what he's saying that's why when you get to the book of revelation jerusalem is that's the people that are called mystery babylon because they took on the lifestyle and everything of babylon recalling when i was tracing the uh harlot's forehead in jeremiah 3 3 and then i showed you the link with exodus 12 13 and then exodus 12 17 where we read about the uh unleavened bread here it comes up again look at it verse 16 chapter 34 continuation from what we just read and you take of his daughters for your sons and his daughters pay the harlot with their gods and make your sons pay the harlot with their gods you shall make no molded gods for yourselves then all of a sudden he switched and said the feast of unleavened bread you shall keep notice first said you shall make no molded gods and then he went and said the feast of unleavened bread you, that mean it's a contrast right there and then he said seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as i commanded you in the appointed time of the month of abib for in the month of abib you came out of from egypt and then look at the living bible he says be sure to celebrate the feast of unleavened bread for seven days just as i instructed you at the dates appointed each year in march that was the month you left Egypt. Notice God is consistent to remind them the day you left Egypt, this feast of unleavened bread, remember it's first the Passover that rolls over into the unleavened bread. And remember what I said about yeast. Now, with that in mind, let me take you back now to going back to Exodus 13. Exodus 13 verse 9 says this annual memorial week will brand you as his own unique people just as though he had branded his mark of ownership upon your hands on your forehead now notice something God is saying the whole thing about the Passover the, the sacrifice that you did the lamb slain pointing to Yeshua the perfect sacrifice which would which would be you know that the scripture says that um, we are purchased by his blood we're not our own so therefore he he's our owner he owns us in fact he owns us more than ma million times because he, he's our maker now th this is the mark the mark will come through this this blood sacrifice and it, it what god says it is to be like a brand a mark upon your forehead and can you understand that the holy spirit brands us marks us to say we are we are owned by christ only when we begin to live that life by accepting the sacrifice and living that crucified life where it says present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to the Lord which is your spiritual worship now the part about as ownership on your hands and all your forehead this verse clearly reminds us of what we're going to read in Revelation 13 the branding on the forehead means nothing more than etching into your mind. You know, when something is branded, seared into your mind, you'll always remember that blood sacrifice of Yeshua. He deserves this kind of a loyalty to him. The statement in verse 9 is so serious that God repeats it in verse 16. He says again, I say, this celebration shall identify you as God's people, just as much as it is. If his brand of ownership were placed upon your foreheads, remember the word forehead it speaks of your thought life, nothing but your thought life. And then it says, it is a reminder that the Lord brought you out of Egypt with great power. We must always remember that. You know, sometimes people say, I'm saved, but do they act like they're saved? Do they live it? No, because there's no showing the great power of God in their lives. The scripture says that God gave the spirit so that we can become sons of God. It's the power of God. The Spirit is a son is a, is a power that makes us have that sonship. I'm going to read again Exodus 13:9 for you to see the connection between that and Revelation 13:16, that critical verse of uh, Revelation. 
remember what it says verse 10 so celebrate the event annually in late March remember that celebration late March is to do with the day that they left Egypt out of their bondage from slavery which I said depicts sin now notice verse 9 this annual memorial will brand you as his own unique people just as though he had branded his mark of ownership upon your hands or your forehead. I've already explained that. So what I'll just do now, lift out Revelation 13 for you. Now take a look at Revelation 13 verse 7. It reads, It was allowed to make war against the saints. The it stands for the beast. The saints refers to holy people and conquered them and given power over every race, people, language, and nation. Now question, I've heard many persons say that the beast is the Pope. They say the beast is a chip, all sort of stuff. Now the question is, would, can, is there any, any power in the world that can be over every race, every people, every language, every nation, except one power, the power of sin. Verse 8 says, and all people of the world will worship it. That is, everybody whose names have not been written down since the foundation of the world in the sacrificial lamb's book of life. What is a sacrificial lamb about? That's Yeshua giving his lifeblood to save us from sin. Now take a look at verse 16 because that is the comparative verse to what we've read in Exodus 39. It reads, It compelled everyone, small and great alike, rich and poor, slave and citizen, to be branded on the right hand or on the forehead. Now when you consider all of this, I want you to go back and think what we have just learned in Exodus chapter 12 and 13. It's all about taking the people out of the land of Egypt, which definitely represents deliverance from sin. Here we're looking at the sacrificial lamb. Here we're seeing the beast speaking about a brand the same thing that God had given them as a memorial to remember the day they were taken out of Egypt out of the land of sin now if you do not get this I don't know what you're gonna get so ponder it pray about it seek the face of the Lord and at this moment I'll have to go so thank you for listening and may God richly bless you.